Hi, well, thanks for joining us. So, as of today, Wolfram Alpha has officially been out in the wild for two years. And I'm happy to say that it's, it's doing really well. You know, I've been thinking about building Wolfram Alpha for more than 30 years, and I've been sort of uh, working to build the, the stack of ideas and technology to make it possible for, for nearly that long. At the beginning, I was not really sure that Wolfram Alpha was going to be possible at all. And I think uh, if I look uh, a year ago from now, my main conclusion was that uh, after a year out in the wild, we'd proved that, yes, Wolfram Alpha was indeed possible. Well, now that we're two years out, I think my conclusion is that Wolfram Alpha is even a lot more important than I thought it was. I mean, this, this sort of effort to make all our knowledge computable is really something very fundamental. It's sort of inevitably going to be needed just all over the place. So, what have we been actually up to this year? I think the most central thing is putting more knowledge, more data, more algorithms, more capabilities into Wolfram Alpha and tuning and, and tightening up uh, what's, what's already there. So Wolfram Alpha is sort of just, in some sense, an absurdly complex object from its underlying software engineering with nearly 20 million lines now of Mathematica code to all the different domains and, and capabilities that it covers. But over this year, I, I have to say that we've been extremely successful in, in building out all the systems that we need, automated software systems and human and management systems, to make it possible to just keep growing, keep scaling up Wolfram Alpha. I mean, we, we always sort of run a portfolio of development efforts from things that complete in, a, in days to weeks to major framework changes that can take uh, multiple years. For example, just recently we've, we've almost finished a major framework change that greatly enhances our linguistic processing capabilities. Uh, we never have figured out all this stuff without being able to see a billion actual queries come through the system. And, and it's, it's pretty fancy algorithmic stuff, but the result is that we've made it faster to process linguistic input, and we're going to be able to handle much more elaborate linguistic forms. And the bottom line is that we've sort of still further increased the fraction of queries that we can understand, so it's now up to about 95%, which I think is, is pretty extremely good. Well, in terms of core content in Wolfram Alpha, over the year we've added all sorts of new domains of knowledge. Uh, there's, a, there's a list of those on the web. I think there was a blog that just went out containing those. I think the main thing we've discovered is that, yes, after you've dealt with you know, 2,000 domains, the 2,001st domain is easier, not least because you get to use everything you already know from the 2,000 previous domains. But it's still sort of irreducibly difficult. I think, I think we're pretty clever, and we've done some pretty amazing automation, but it's really, really clear that there just isn't a magic bullet in all of this. If you, if you actually want to get the right answers reliably, there's, uh, there's real algorithmic and human effort that you have to put in. Well, part of the good news is that there are so many people out in the world who want to help us to make Wolfram Alpha really shine in every different area. Sort of world experts in almost anything. Uh, also, a wonderful group of volunteers who help with data curation in, in their areas of expertise. Well, so okay, when, when Wolfram Alpha was first launched, it was a website. But what we've learned is that really the system we've built is much broader and more significant than that. It's sort of an inevitable building block. It's a, it's a generic enabler and accelerator of kind of the, the knowledge economy. So taking all that knowledge that our civilization has accumulated and letting it be applied to every possible specific problem whenever and wherever it's needed. Okay, so a big theme of this year has been understanding just how to deploy Wolfram Alpha, through what channels and mechanisms. I mean, if you'd asked me two years ago how many of these different channels and mechanisms there would be, I would probably have said three or four. But now we've figured out there are probably at least 15 of them. So let me give you a few examples. Well, one of the things that's great about WolframAlpha.com is that it ultimately has an extremely simple interface, just a single input field. And from that input field, you get all this power and computational capability and so on. But the challenge then is to learn what you can really do with that input field. Well, I think one of the things that's gradually been happening is that people have a better and better mental model of what's possible with Wolfram Alpha. And we can see from the query stream that people really use Wolfram Alpha to do serious things, things that really make sense. We get some tourist traffic, but mostly we get people who robustly want to actually use Wolfram Alpha to achieve things. But one of the issues is that people can't figure out all the things that they can actually do with Wolfram Alpha. So what we realized is that in the modern kind of apt world, we could make that easier. So we're building lots of specialized apps that are powered by Wolfram Alpha, but that organize things in a very ergonomic way for each particular type of user or, or usage. And actually, in the next 12 months, we expect to release at least 100 such apps. 
we've got half a dozen out already. One, one series is course assistant apps. Kind of the concept is to create an app for every, for every course. Then there are professional apps, reference apps, lots more. Perhaps, perhaps in a bit I'll do a demo of some of these. But anyway, apps are sort of one deployment channel for Wolfram Alpha. Uh, another is, is uh, search engine integration. You know, it's interesting. I think over the course of this year, we can see a definite trend that people's sort of expectations about information on the web are shifting. People really want answers. They don't want to be sort of pointed to a bunch of links, for example. They actually want whatever question they have to be answered. Well, part of that shift of expectation has, I think, happened because of mobile and network speeds, screen sizes, make people want their, their machines to do more in automating things and just sort of getting to the result. Well, that happens to be great for us because it brings people much closer in mental model to what Wolfram Alpha has always been set up to do. The question is, how does one get the best of both worlds, search plus knowledge? We've learned a lot, particularly from our partnership with, with Microsoft and Bing. I mean, the constraints, both sort of cognitive and engineering, for the search engine environment are different from the knowledge engine environment. Um, and one of the things we've done this year is really to develop mechanisms to handle that, very fast ways to triage a search engine query stream and work out which queries Wolfram Alpha can expect to handle well, ways to bring up summary boxes incredibly fast, even in some cases to answer questions instantly, like we do with simple math right on the wolframalpha.com website. Well, it's taken a, a while to understand this stuff, but we've got some, some great products for search engine integration coming out soon. And uh, we'll, you, you'll, you'll see a bunch of work done with, with partners on that. Well, there are lots of other channels for Wolfram Alpha too. Uh, another that's coming soon is, is integration with user data. You'll see that first in the professional version of Wolfram Alpha, which allows for customization of output, user-defined input shortcuts, extensive data downloading options, and also uploading of user data. See, eventually, you'll want Wolfram Alpha to sort of just suck in all sorts of ambient data for you, your social graph, images you've got, spreadsheets, things from your file system, and so on, and be able to compute from those things as well as from, from public data. And eventually, part of the goal is just sort of automatically, preemptively, to get computations done without any need to even explicitly request them. Well, with Wolfram Alpha just sort of figuring out from your data environment what you want to know. Well, OK. so. There have been uh, lots of new directions like this th this year. Um, one that I find interesting is the integration we've done with, with Mathematica. Um, I mean, even though Wolfram Alpha is built on top of Mathematica, Wolfram Alpha and Mathematica are very different things. Mathematica is a precise programming language in which one can build sort of arbitrarily complex programs. Wolfram Alpha, at some level, is a, is a sort of sloppy drive-by system with extremely broad knowledge and capabilities, but with a very simple mechanism for giving inputs. Well, one of the things we did this year is to combine these two, to make it so that inside Mathematica, one can just use the freeform linguistics of Wolfram Alpha and have it automatically translate that freeform linguistics to precise Mathematica code, so that you don't have to be a programmer uh, at all uh, anymore to be able to create precise Mathematica code. You can just use plain, plain language to do programming. That's something that went into Mathematica 8 that we released late last year, and it's having quite a transformative effect in many areas where Mathematica has long been used, for example, in education. By the way, the integration of Mathematica with Wolfram Alpha is going the other way, too. Soon we'll be launching Wolfram Alpha Interactive, which uses Mathematica-based computable document format CDF technology to let results from Wolfram Alpha be interactive directly on your computer. Somewhat related to that, there are all sorts of things going on with Wolfram Alpha in the publishing world and in courseware development. Uh, our spin-off company, Touch Press, that's published the best-selling, highly interactive iPad eBooks this past year, has used Wolfram Alpha in all of its titles and has been experimenting with all sorts of interesting ways to pull computational knowledge into diverse kinds of books. And we're, and we're going to have various tools to make it really easy to insert Wolfram Alpha into documents, whether just through dynamic links or with widgets or by embedding automatically updating pods of information or, or whatever. You know, it, it's interesting. There are all these different ways and places to deliver computational knowledge. And one of the great things is that when you're computing results, you just have a lot of freedom about exactly what to generate, what to output, how to structure things. So on WolframAlpha.com, you enter a simple query and you get this whole report out. 
Um, and uh, we've done all sorts of usability studies over the last year or so, and the conclusion that keeps on coming back, it keeps on being the same, is really very satisfying, that, that what we've done really works well. People are able to sort of visually find the information they want really fast, and they also, perhaps more importantly, learn useful things that they weren't already expecting, um, and they really like that. Well, with Wolfram Alpha in Mathematica, one of the main interfaces is actually different. There's, uh, uh, what one wants to do is to insert specific results into a whole sequence of results in a session, being able to use one result to get the next result and so on. So one wants just a single result by default. And there's actually a whole spectrum of short answers to get from Wolfram Alpha, the kind of thing you'd want in SMS or for responses from a bot or for responses in audio format and so on. And that's another direction that we're experimenting with. Well, so lots going on with Wolfram Alpha. Uh, I think at year two, we are, we're really in gear. The technology and content side of things is really humming along. And we're now really understanding the product and business side of things, uh, sort of how to take what we're building and deploy it and distribute it as widely as possible. You know, Wolfram Alpha is ultimately a never-ending project. And in many ways, we're still just at the very beginning. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with... Uh, uh, with where we've reached so far, and I'm, I'm looking forward to what we'll be able to achieve in the years to come, and particularly in this coming year. Well, okay, that's enough of a speech. Let's get down to some discussion here. So, who has the first question? Let's see. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up this name. Ahmet Yuxelturk. Okay. Uh, when will the localization of Wolfram Alpha start? So, actually, even in Wolfram Alpha today, um, there's a certain amount that you can do with other languages. Now, I'm going to mess this up because I have to say I, I really don't know uh, um, any languages other than English. I learned Latin and Ancient Greek and French when I was a kid, but uh, uh, I don't think I'm, I'm fluent in Latin or anything. And I, I already messed this up. I was going to show you that, um, uh, let's see, um, oh gosh, I'm so terrible at this. Um, I. I, I can't demo this because I don't know other languages. Um, but uh, uh, Wolfram Alpha has actually, for, for some time, for, for close to a year, I believe, been able to do a certain amount of, um, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time because I partly don't know how to type accents. Um, let's try something like, uh, something like this. I've got to be able to show you something. Okay, well, at least we, we, got, we, we, we managed to get at least some micro-translation happening here. Um, but Wolfram Alpha has been set up for about 30 languages to be able to do at least word-for-word uh, -word and phrase-for-phrase -phrase translation. Now, it's sort of an interesting thing. We've got, we've got uh, there are several kinds of localization that need to happen in Wolfram Alpha. One is the understanding of input. Another is the generation of output. And another is the use of uh, increasingly deep localized data. So all three of those things have sort of different technology issues around them. In terms of the, uh, uh, the, the, the understanding of input, what we've done so far is something that actually works much better than I'd expected it to work. Because Wolfram Alpha has a very robust mechanism for parsing languages, um, and because it is used to the fact that people don't type in perfect flowing English, um, it's set up so that even though the things that come through could be quite, uh, could be quite sort of uh, poorly structured and fragmented, it's able to do a certain amount just by doing word for word and phrase, translate, phrase for phrase translation for languages. And as I say, that works now for about 30 languages, and you can try it out and, and see how it does. That's really not a, an ultimate solution for how to understand uh, different languages as input. And ultimately, our whole internal grammar and parsing system has to be set up for each different language and to deal with all of the detailed linguistic differences between languages. Uh, we've built the framework for doing that. Uh, we are expecting to work with partners in different uh, language areas um, to actually do the, uh, the work of setting things up for, for all those different languages. So that's on the side of input. Actually, probably input is easier than output. Because for output, we have to be able to synthesize um, all of the, uh, the kinds of things that we currently give as, as pieces of English. We have to be able to synthesize perfect versions of those um, in, in all other languages. Um, it's easy to get broken versions of other languages, but we don't think that's adequate. We want uh, really the perfect versions of those things. Well, then there's the issue of localized data. Uh, we've taken, put a lot of effort 
into uh, getting as much data internationally as we can. But realistically, uh, we've also been able to get much deeper data um, on the US, for example, than we have on any other country. And again, working with partners in other countries, um, we hope to be able to get very deep data um, in, each different, uh, in each different country and for each different language group. There are all kinds of incredibly scary things that happen when you deal with localized data. I mean, one of the ones that's just bizarre beyond anything else is, for example, names of animals in different areas, which actually are localized even beyond the level of countries. And they, they happen to be uh, kind of strangely, um, uh, strange sort of cultural references and so on. So that's a little bit on, on localization. Let's see, next question here um, from Paul Beacon. Um, are there considerations to provide a subscription version of Wolfram Alpha? The answer to that is definitely yes. Um, the professional version of Wolfram Alpha will be coming quite soon. Um, it'll have uh, a whole collection of, uh, of new capabilities. Um, the, uh, the first, um, I, I mentioned a few of these. Um, among them are being able to specify different formats for output, both in terms of uh, having data to download for a spreadsheet or for, uh, you know, tech or for a 3D uh, modeling system um, or for uh, some other kind of um, uh, format. We're kind of leveraging the fact that Mathematica supports about 200 different kinds of import-export formats covering a huge variety of areas um, to be able to do that kind of thing with, with Wolfram Alpha. Um, and also to be able to set it up so that if you want to take a, a, a graphic, for example, from, from Wolfram Alpha and um, uh, put it um, in you know, your PowerPoint presentation or something, you'll be able to specify custom formatting uh, for that within Wolfram Alpha to generate it in, in the right form for, for you. And the same thing will happen in, in, uh, in describing the actual format of, of Wolfram Alpha output on the, on the page. Once we can uh, sort of have subscribers and, and users specifically specify preferences and so on, um, we can do a certain amount more in customizing uh, the look of Wolfram Alpha and also conventions about how it outputs things and so on. Then uh, there's uh, also the ability to specify kind of shorthand inputs for Wolfram Alpha to store uh, various kinds of uh, preferences and favorites and so on. And then a uh, very big thing is uh, the upload of, of your own data, as I was mentioning. Um, that's something that will be coming with the, with the subscription version. Another thing that's coming is uh, premium data. Um, so uh, among other things, w w our uh, upstream sources of data um, have often made uh, large-scale businesses out of, uh, uh, of selling data of various kinds. Um, we and they would very much like their data to be available through Wolfram Alpha as a distribution channel, but uh, we need a way to, uh, to explicitly monetize that. And so there'll be a mechanism through the subscription system um, to have premium data um, that uh, can be either purchased directly or, um, uh, or purchased through points with a subscription. Let's see. Uh, next question is, will Wolfram Alpha support all the Mathematica inputs? Um, that's actually something where, uh, that's been an interesting challenge. So clearly there are some Mathematica inputs that we're not going to support, like the input that says, you know, delete the files on the disk, these kinds of things. Um, but uh, once we've sort of sandboxed things appropriately and, uh, uh, and so on, um, we are, uh, th the next challenge is this. Uh, we can easily make Wolfram Alpha's syntax um, support kind of a full direct Mathematica input. That's extremely straightforward. The problem is that what we've noticed is that people realize that, gosh, I'm talking to Wolfram Alpha, I'm not talking to Mathematica, so let me kind of mix sort of some Wolfram Alpha E's of, you know, functions with lowercase letters and parens and all this kind of thing, along with the precise Mathematica syntax. And that's somewhat harder to decode. And there are also pieces of Mathematica syntax which actually correspond to things that are quite common in kind of everyday usage of things, but means something different in Mathematica. So it's a little bit tricky to, to get um, uh, uh, sort of the full understanding of, of absolutely all Mathematica syntax, given that it's being mixed with sort of fragments of, of non-Mathematica syntax. But it's a metric that we're tracking and we're working towards that. Um, it's something that uh, uh, they're also uh, will be supporting probably some um, 
uh, some explicit ways to feed in Mathematica input if you know that you're going to give a precise piece of Mathematica syntax, although I predict people will not be happy with that because they'll keep on sort of falling down into, into using kind of mixed syntaxes and so on. How expensive will the professional version be? I think it'll be quite, uh, uh, it'll be well-priced. I think it'll be, it'll, uh, be something which, uh, for anybody who uses Wolfram Alpha in, in a serious way, it really won't be uh, any, kind of, uh, any kind of issue. Um, but uh, uh, that's, that's something still under active discussion, and there will be multiple levels of, uh, uh, of subscription capability um, and uh, multiple ways to, uh, to process um, data that's been uploaded and so on. In the future, will Wolfram Alpha suggest related terms? Well, actually, we we've, we put in a few months ago. We put in um, uh, something. Let's let's try. Um, I don't know. Let's try some some random query here. Let's say London population. Um, if we do that and we scroll down here, oh, this particular. Oh, there we go. Um, out on the side here, there's um, there's a collection of related Wolfram Alpha queries, and um, that's sort of an interesting problem actually generating. Um, related queries, because what we want to do is both do things which kind of correspond to drill down of the existing query, and we want to also kind of surprise people a little bit and suggest um, things that are uh, sort of related to what's been input, um, but kind of point people off in a slightly different direction. Let's see. Next. Uh, well, maybe by related terms you might have meant something different. I mean, if, if you mean by that... Um, uh, things with words, I don't know, if we type in a word, um, uh, obviously we're, we're trying to suggest um, uh, synonyms and so on in, in, in terms of uh, handling things with words, but, but, but I suspect you meant kind of related Wolfram Alpha queries. Let's see, what's next here? Let's see, the question is how to help people know how to ask something to Wolfram Alpha. I've seen that Wolfram Alpha is pretty good, but people do not always know how to make questions, even in natural language. Um, yes, that's a, uh, you know, there are really two answers to that. One is, what we want Wolfram Alpha to be able to do is to take whatever people think of asking it and be able to understand what they're asking and respond. And that's something that we gradually uh, work towards being able to do more and more of. That's not something that we can kind of do in an abstract theoretical sense because we've got to sort of capture what it is that people actually think how people actually express their thoughts and so on. The good news is we've got billions of examples of that from our query logs. Um, and uh, a big effort that we have is going through and understanding what people, how people have expressed themselves, both when they've expressed themselves in ways that Wolfram Alpha can currently understand and when they've expressed themselves in ways that Wolfram Alpha can't yet understand. So sort of the first step is let's make it so that um, Wolfram Alpha can understand things the way people choose to express those things. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is we've obviously got uh, lots of examples of Wolfram Alpha usage. We've got the related queries kinds of things. Um, we've also introduced another thing actually in the course of this year, which is the nearest interpretation mechanism. So for instance, if I type a query like, uh, you always used to type the query France goats as an example of a query that Wolfram Alpha would never be able to do um, until suddenly about uh, a year ago, um, we got the appropriate data and we are able to do this. But if we say uh, France goats with very shaggy coats, um, Wolfram Alpha will not be able to do that query, at least I, I don't expect it. Um, and what will now happen, um, and this is a, a fairly new thing, is that we're kind of thinking about the space of queries that we can handle. And this little pink box here is saying we're using the closest Wolfram Alpha interpretation um, and uh, we're, we're trying to go sort of from this actual query that somebody has asked to this kind of fuzzy space of queries that we can understand. We're trying to find out what's the nearest point and then at least be able to handle that query. Actually, one thing that's probably going to come soon is a kind of uh, cognitive coding of how close we think that query is likely to be, um, sort of help people in understanding whether we just kind of really wimped out and just picked out a few words in their query to respond to, or whether we're really uh, expecting that, our, that, the, that the thing we're responding to is very close to what they imagined they were asking. But OK, so these are solutions that uh, involve kind of just being able to make Wolfram Alpha map better onto sort of human cognitive space. Um, there's a different solution, which is 
to really sort of preemptively show people what Wolfram Alpha can do to provide a really direct discovery interface to Wolfram Alpha. And I think our best solution to that right now is these specialized apps that we're building based on Wolfram Alpha. And this maybe gives me an excuse to actually show off some of these things. Let's see what I can do here. Um, let's see. I think these apps, hold on a second. I have to set this up so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, there we go. And I think I have to turn uh, the iPad on its side. Um, and hopefully, oh, there we go. Um, OK, so for instance, uh, well, here are some of our um, course apps. Let's see if I can get that um, uh, properly in focus here. Um, so for instance, um, well, here's the calculus app. Um, and so what you see here is kind of this uh, simple discovery interface where you've got a thing here that says integrate. Um, you say, what are you going to integrate? Now it brings up this kind of very specialized keyboard that kind of shows you the things that you can do. Um, and so, you know, let me say something like, uh, you know, cosine x times uh, square root of x or something. And let me go ahead and compute that. And now it's using Wolfram well, Alpha to do that computation. But what had happened here is we've got this kind of uh, interface where, and hopefully it's connected to the network. Oh, there we go. Um, I guess that wasn't such an easy integral. Um, it, uh, uh, we're using Wolfram Alpha to do the computation, but we're providing this sort of explicit, uh, uh, easy to navigate discovery interface for this particular area. And for example, here I can say, you know, how do you do a definite integral? Well, you can press the definite button there um, to get that um, uh, to, to get that specified. And as I say, we have a lot of these different apps coming. We actually be interested in suggestions from people about what apps we should be building. Um, there are apps both in the uh, in the educational area. Um, there are also apps, uh, for example, in, um, uh, in professional areas. Um, uh, one that's coming here. Let's see. This is one for network administrators, um, and uh, there are there are a whole bunch of different different kinds of apps aimed at people who are. Uh, uh, who are interested in specific areas and then giving them a, a, a kind of maximally ergonomic interface um, to, uh, uh, to, to, um, uh, to Wolfram Alpha. Okay, next question here. Is there a possibility of Wolfram Alpha integrating with Google or Wikipedia? Well, those are two very different kinds of things. Um, Google, the search engine, as I mentioned, uh, we've been developing a bunch of technology that's aimed in the direction of search engine integration. Um, actually, a whole lot of technical work has been done, uh, even specifically uh, in that case. Um, but uh, in general, with, with many different uh, search engines, um, to, uh, to understand kind of what the different constraints are in uh, both cognitively and technically in delivering knowledge within the context of a, of a search experience. Uh, so, for instance, when, when you're delivering computational knowledge, um, if you expect as a user to get the answer to your question, if you have to wait for one and a half seconds to get that answer, you're probably still really pretty happy because you're going to get the answer. On the other hand, if what you're going to be shown is a page of links that you then have to click on to go somewhere else to do this or that, your level of patience for how long you're prepared to wait to see that first result is much shorter. And so there are different constraints associated with, can you return something about what Wolfram Alpha can say really, really fast to sort of fit in with the kind of time expectations for the return of links and so on? Uh, that's one kind of issue. There are other kinds of issues about how do you use the right kind of screen real estate um, to present things in sort of the pithiest way. Um, but I think uh, one thing we've seen in general with, with search engines is the great desire to really be able to deliver at the top of the page before you kind of go into the here are places to look kind of uh, results to be able to deliver sort of the, the hole in one type answer if that's possible. So in terms of Wikipedia, um, that's something where really, uh, you know, Wikipedia is, is sort of uh, uh, for the, the crowd. Um, to, uh, to set up and, and contribute to. Certainly, Jimmy Wales and I have had all sorts of discussions about uh, what the best kinds of ways that um, things can, can be done collaboratively between Wikipedia and us. Um, I think really that's pretty much up to the Wikipedia community at this point um, to, do, to figure out um, how to set things up so that it's possible to have the appropriate kind of uh, real-time data links from Wikipedia to Wolfram Alpha and so on. 
um, we actually uh, have uh, our Wolfram Alpha widgets, um, which uh, we've said we'd be prepared to see um, included in Wikipedia pages um, as something that we would sort of provide as a, as a free service to the Wikipedia community. Um, but that's something that requires a little bit of back-end technical work um, on the Wikipedia side, um, plus uh, kind of the desire to have that kind of integration, um, which I think is very valuable because I, I know, you know, I can see from the other side um, that, uh, you know, we've gone to all this effort to really uh, have a well-curated uh, collection of information um, in, in Wolfram Alpha, um, and, that's, and to be able to update it on a, on a real-time basis um, that's not something that really is, is uh, I wouldn't wish that on anybody else to have to do that. And since we have all the infrastructure to do it, I think it'd be great to see uh, a higher level of integration there. Um, it's something where in, uh, in Wolfram Alpha, we've provided links to related Wikipedia articles for a long time. Um, we've actually found in this year, we've been starting to actually flow a little bit more narrative information into, into Wolfram Alpha than we had done before. So, for example, we've, uh, we've got things from, um, uh, from things like uh, uh, Math World. Let's see I, if I say, um, I'm just going to pick a completely random uh, math topic and let's see what, uh, what happens here. Um, okay. Um, no, that didn't. Um, let's try another one. Let's say something like, um, uh, um, I'm suddenly blanking out on... Um, on, on good topics here. Let's say um, uh, something like this. Um, so here we've got um, uh, the possibility of just saying, uh, show us a mathematical definition about a closed curve or something. Um, there are also things that are sort of intermediate between these things. Like if I say, you know, again, a mathy kind of thing, let's say Fermat's last theorem, um, I'll get something which is sort of a mixture of narrative text um, with things that are sort of more obviously computable data, like when was it formulated and uh, when was it proved and, and so on. Um, so one of the things that we're doing actually is moving in more in the direction uh, of including some kinds of narrative uh, 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 material within the context of Wolfram Alpha because we found out that that's something that we can really do. We, we initially had thought it's just not computable enough, um, but actually it turns out that there are really good ways that we can handle that. I was going to say that one of the challenges um, looking at something like Wikipedia um, is uh, kind of how does that relate in terms of the, the data and so on that's available there to what we have in Wolfram Alpha. And the answer is that the, the data there is really has never been terribly useful to us because it just isn't systematic enough. I mean, for us, what we've discovered is that the right way to handle things is really to go to the sort of the definitive sources of data um, and then to really work with them to really set things up so that things are consistent and computable and so on. Uh, whereas in Wikipedia, what's tended to happen is there may be some consistent underlying source, but then 500 different people have made small edits in different places, and the result is that, uh, uh, that there really isn't a lot of consistency left, and, and so on. Uh, Wikipedia has, however, been very useful to us in providing sort of folk information about things like, what are things typically called? What's the most famous of three things that are called, that have the same name? Uh, those kinds of things. Um, so there's sort of a, a, an important kind of uh, uh, way that we, we get to make use of, uh, of what's happened there. Next question is, uh, will Wolfram Alpha stay as a computational engine or will it also become a search engine? That's an interesting question. I, I think what we, uh, uh, what we are trying to do is to take sort of the world's knowledge and structure it so that one can answer questions based on that knowledge, answer specific questions that maybe have never been asked before. The mission is very different from a, the traditional mission of a search engine. The traditional mission of a search engine is to say, let's look at the text that exists out there on the web and let's match up the particular search terms that the person is entering with something that's already been written down by somebody on the web. Um, it's a very different mission. Um, but uh, one thing that I certainly notice is that when you actually look at what search engines do, um, and you uh, and you know we've worked with, with, with them too, um, it's uh, uh, there's a lot that can be informed in that search process from the kind of explicit curated computational knowledge that we have. Even at the level of, you know, you type the name of some, you, you're trying to get to some website, you know, it's maybe 20% of all search engine queries are these so-called navigation queries uh, where people are just trying to get to a website. 
they're trying to remember what the, uh, what the URL is for some particular company or, or some such other thing. Uh, so for those kinds of things, that's a problem extremely similar to what we solve already in Wolfram Alpha, where we've got sort of curated linguistics and where we can also answer potentially questions like, uh, you know, I want to get to the website of the largest company that makes uh, uh, such and such a kind of product, for instance. Um, so that's something where sort of we're merging uh, kind of the computational knowledge side of things with more traditional search kinds of things. It's also the case, I think, that uh, uh, the web is increasingly curatable. Um, the, the set of kind of uh, uh, really good definitive sites on things is, uh, has, has largely stabilized. Um, and it's something where one can increasingly sort of curate actually being able to get to those different, different sites. There's also a different level, which is the kind of the deep trawl of the web. You know, you've got a person's name and you just want to say, what can I find out about this person? Or there's some product, what can I find out about this product anywhere? That's something which, again, has a, has a certain computational character to it, uh, where one is potentially interested in sort of some summarization of what's out there on the web that looks a lot more like a kind of computational knowledge thing, where just the web is just one great big source of data, just like we might have data from you know, uh, uh, sensors from some particular kind of thing uh, that's happening in the world or, or some such other thing. So I think that these, these concepts, uh, some of the technology that we've built is highly relevant for these kinds of things. Um, in terms of uh, uh, will, you know, will we have a, a traditional crawl the web, match up search terms kind of thing, that's not our direction. You know, people have already solved that problem and I think what we're going to see in the, in, the, in the time to come is an increasing number of people having come up with good solutions to that problem with slightly different uh, twists about how ranking is done and, and, and so on. One thing that you will see from us is a search experiment website um, where we're combining search with computational knowledge. Uh, really, that's, if anything, a test bed for the ways that we can do search engine integration uh, with, with partners who, who are running search engines. Next question here. Will there eventually be an easy, almost trivial way to curate private content for, say, corporations or research organizations or even individuals? So here's the story. The, when we get in raw data, uh, you know, we, we uh, kind of uh, uh, have a big effort kind of uh, uh, understanding where the best sources of raw data are in the world. Uh, for example, last year and again this year we'll be sponsoring a data summit where we uh, uh, invite uh, leaders of most of the world's large public data repositories and we had a terrific conference last year. I'm looking forward to an even better conference this year. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, places where we can get wonderful raw data. But you know, one of the things we found is that given that raw data, it's sort of only 5% of the problem to get terrific raw data. The other 95% of the problem is to take that raw data and really make it computable. Really understand what the data means, even things like what units it's in, how things are defined. Um, understand what kinds of computations one needs to do to actually answer questions from that data. I mean, I think one of my kind of statements is if you look at kind of the world of, of, uh, of, of curated data, uh, there's a lot of trends one sees. Actually, I, I might mention there's one cool thing that we have. Um, let's see, shall I try and actually show this? Let me try and show it. We, have a, we, we decided we'd sort of understand something about the flow of history in, uh, in systematic data. And so for our data summit last year, um, we, uh, we decided to make a, a sort of poster that shows sort of the historical flow of how systematic data has arisen in the world. Um, and so let's see, I actually have a copy of it here. Let's see if this works. And this is, this is sort of a timeline from, uh, from the Babylonians to today of, um, uh, of kind of um, systematic data and how it's arisen. Um, actually, it's pretty interesting for me to watch. Um, you can kind of uh, plot a very fascinating kind of rate of innovation in, uh, in data and computable knowledge from this. And there have been these fascinating bursts of activity at different times in history. I think one of, the, one of my observations from this sort of flow of history is that the two entities, the two sort of uh, 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 places where there's been the most uh, energetic sort of uh, uh, efforts in, in systematic data are the Babylonians and the United States. Um, the Babylonians who got to sort of be the first folks who had cities and had to organize things for those and invented writing and censuses and astronomical tables and mathematical tables and all sorts of other things and codes of law and, and things like that. And the US 
for whatever reason, even from its founding, seemed to be a, uh, a sort of a, a very data-oriented uh, place. And an awful lot of the innovations have been sort of U.S. governmental kinds of, uh, uh, of things that have happened over the course of not just the last century or so, but, but longer ago than that. But anyway, so we, we sort of get to see the flow of, of, uh, of how systematic data has arisen in the world. I was going to say that one of the things that sort of happened in modern times is that there's been this sort of transition to get data from sort of paper form, you know, published in books or whatever else, to some kind of digital form. Well, that's an important transition, but that's only part of what needs to be done. Just having a blob of data, you know, in some database or spreadsheet or something like that uh, is only a small part of sort of being able to get to the point where you can really answer questions from that data. The, the second stage is getting to make data really computable. And I, I think it's uh, sort of an observation that I have that people in large organizations that have uh, large amounts of data, they kind of say, it's really shocking that we still have data on paper. We've just got to get it into digital form. It's, it's really dead meat if it's, if it's still on paper. Well, I think uh, in not very long, people are going to be saying the same thing about data that's just in digital form as a blob of data and hasn't really been made computable. So now the issue is what, uh, you know, we've got a lot of experience now with Wolfram Alpha in making data computable. It's hard work. We've developed some really good automation, really good kind of human management processes to do it, but it's still sort of an irreducible amount of hard work. We've got actually a very successful uh, kind of uh, consulting and professional services practice that's around building curated data systems uh, for outside organizations, and there are now a bunch of custom Wolfram Alphas running in a bunch of companies and other kinds of organizations uh, that are operating on the, uh, the internal data of those organizations and providing a Wolfram Alpha experience uh, for those organizations. It's kind of a, a major uptick from what one might traditionally expect from things like business intelligence and, and so on, to really have this computational knowledge available there. So now a big question is, to what extent is it possible for us to completely automate that, to make it so that uh, instead of having to do all this, uh, all this work to get to the point where data is curated, that we can have it so that uh, at least to some level that happens automatically. Well, we've, we've done quite a bit of, uh, of work on that. And I think what I can say is this, that to get the full Wolfram Alpha experience on a particular kind of data is still going to be a bunch of work. Um, the, uh, we are going to increasingly be able to automate getting sort of certain distances towards the full Wolfram Alpha experience. So in the professional version of Wolfram Alpha, we expect to have various kinds of uh, uh, data understanding wizards that make use of our linguistic capabilities to be able to understand that, yes, the columns of this spreadsheet correspond to countries or something like this, um, and to be able to match the entities that are there with entities that we understand in Wolfram Alpha. Um, I think that uh, we've also done some work on really being able to go through, for example, a large, uh, 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 let's say, legacy or other database system in a company and, and sort of be able to actually understand all the database schemas and uh, uh, be able to sort of extract information in a way that's computable from that system. That's something that uh, we've been thinking about putting more emphasis onto, um, but uh, hasn't yet quite risen to the point where uh, where we're really uh, committed to doing it. And actually, I think that's a thing that's likely to happen uh, in, a, in a partnering mode with, with uh, another large company um, rather than something that we, uh, we do just on our own. Next question here. Questions on nested queries. When will Wolfram Alpha allow nested queries? So I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but if you mean things like... Uh, um, what's the country with the largest population and, uh, uh, I don't know, what, what's, what's the weather 20 miles south of the capital city of the country with the largest population or some such other thing? Um, the answer to that is, uh, actually, we've spent the last two years building uh, the technology that will make things like that possible. Um, and that will be going in, actually, even in the next uh, weeks to months you'll see increasing capability to do those kinds of things. It's been sort of a big competition internally between our data cloud system, which provides a sort of abstraction and generalization of, of uh, kind of relational data queries and so on, um, together with uh, the linguistic ability to be able to express those kinds of queries. Um, we've been in a position to kind of uh, 
Uh, so, so both of those things have been being developed, both the expression of more complex queries, nested queries of that kind, and the ability to, as, as in the, in the uh, few hundred milliseconds that we have available to be able to actually answer the thing, to be able to be efficient enough at actually answering them. And this is, uh, this is something that um, uh, is, is now happening. So I think uh, you know, we, can, we can certainly start to ask things like movies, starring, Tom Cruise, and grossing more than, let's say, $20 million. I don't know if that will work yet. Let's see. Um, not yet. Not yet. So um, let's try movies starring Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. How about that? Um, th these are things, as I say, that will be coming into the system over the next, um, uh, that's surprising. OK. Um, it's, uh, th these are things that will be coming into the system over the next weeks to months. So let's see. Uh, next question was, do you foresee a time when Wolfram Alpha will be able to answer more complex problems, such as theorem proving or solving scientific problems of various kinds? Well, theorem proving, um, we're actually able to do a little bit of that already, making use of Mathematica theorem proving capabilities. Um, uh, you know, not. You know, if I enter some kind of logic question, um, we're able to uh, uh, figure out sort of what um, uh, different transformations of this, and we're able to figure out is it is it a tautology? You know, is it possible to to satisfy it? Those kinds of things. Um, we actually have in Mathematica pretty powerful equational theorem proving capabilities, um, but uh, uh, in my own experience, the um, the set of things that can be formulated simply enough to sort of state them as as a, a kind of straightforward things to prove like that is a, is a bit thin. Um, we've actually had a project that we haven't gotten finished for some time um, that uh, has to do with taking axiom systems that exist in mathematics and curating their features and being able to, uh, uh, to work with them in Wolfram Alpha. Let me actually mention a, another project that um, we're hoping to do. Uh, it has to do with the following thing. So, uh, in mathematics, and this is now going to be a little bit of a, a math geek kind of moment here, um, in mathematics there have been sort of a, a different traditions about what mathematics really means, what, what one does when one does mathematics. Um, there's sort of one major tradition, which is the one that, for example, Mathematica and to some extent Wolfram Alpha uh, follow, is the let's compute an answer to a question. Um, let's go from a, an input to an output. Let's uh, solve an equation. Let's compute something. Um, where we're sort of getting a, a definite computation done. There's another style of mathematics which uh, uh, was particularly strong in kind of uh, some aspects of 20th century pure mathematics, which is the let's create some mathematical structure and let's start proving theorems about it. So instead of saying let's compute the answer to something, it's more let you know f be a field with these properties, let's build up this kind of abstract mathematical structure and then understand various features of it. Well, I had wondered for a long time, what's the way to automate kind of that kind of sort of structure, theorem-based mathematics? And I finally realized uh, a bit more than a year ago that with Wolfram Alpha, we finally have a way to automate that kind of mathematics. And see, in Wolfram Alpha, we're not, in a sense, just uh, computing answers. We're also given an input. We're saying what's interesting based on that input. We're synthesizing things to say based on that input. And that's exactly what I realized one needs to do in this kind of mathematics. Given a description of a mathematical structure, then the, 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 uh, the mission of the machine should be to, to synthesize interesting theorems, interesting facts about that mathematical structure. And that is something that we are, we're thinking about doing in Wolfram Alpha. Uh, one of the things that needs to be done if we're going to do that is to curate the three million or so theorems that exist in the mathematical literature um, and uh, we are kind of looking at um, through probably through our Wolfram Foundation uh, sort of philanthropic arm uh, because we don't think this is a very commercially significant project um, at uh, working with with people to um, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to 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 do this sort of to create kind of the ultimate computable archive of mathematics. It'll be a big project. It'll involve lots of mathematicians with lots of uh, specific knowledge, but the result will be something where I hope will be able to sort of compute, given a mathematical structure or object that somebody has come up with in their research or whatever else, we'll be able to say interesting things about it. 
So you ask about scientific problems of various kinds. Um, I think one of the things that I've been interested in for a long time is, uh, is how do we get Wolfram Alpha to actually invent and discover things um, that are really uh, sort of outside of the algorithmic structures and models um, that, uh, uh, that we've spent all this effort sort of building into Wolfram Alpha. So in a sense, Wolfram Alpha is a collection of sort of algorithmic knowledge that has, that has been accumulated through sort of scientific work and other things in, in, uh, in the development of systematic knowledge. The question is, can we go out sort of out in left field and go and discover new stuff? Well, in my work on a new kind of science, um, I've spent a lot of effort trying to understand how you can explore, how you can mine the computational universe of possible programs to do just that, to, to just go out and discover things that you never expected were there. Um, and so one of the things that we're certainly thinking about in Wolfram Alpha is how can you, for example, state a constraint. Say, I want to create a, uh, uh, a way to you know, tile this floor so that it will satisfy these constraints. Or I want to create a way that will make some kind of uh, uh, you know, acoustic um, uh, baffle that has these properties or a circuit that has these properties. Can we then creatively have Wolfram Alpha go out and sort of search this computational universe of possibilities and come up with a creative inventive solution? Well, eventually we will be able to do that. Whether we'll be able to do it in the one second or so that that's sort of allowed in the Wolfram Alpha current uh, kind of um, uh, user interaction loop, I'm not sure. But that's definitely a direction that we're interested in going to be able to sort of invent things in that way. It's also relevant at a more pragmatic level. Uh, one of the things we want to do with Wolfram Alpha is to let Wolfram Alpha interact more with products. So, you know, a typical thing is there are millions of different products that exist. And you say, well, I want to get a product that will allow me to achieve a particular objective. Um, and uh, sometimes knowing how to achieve that objective requires both knowing something about what products are available and being able to compute something on the basis of some kind of model or perhaps some kind of specific information about the user to see whether there's sort of a match, to see how you build up from, uh, from one thing to another. So let me give you a very trivial example. Let's say um, uh, I uh, type in, this is um, some number of, uh, uh, of ohms um, for a resistor. Let's see if we have this. Oh my gosh, we don't have that. Let me just see something here. I'm now going to cheat, and I'm going to use the internal development version here. So just uh, um, I'm going to use a, uh, um, a different, uh, different thing. OK, uh, but now I need to make it bigger. Um, OK, so I typed in some random number of ohms. And um, uh, what's interesting here is that um, the, uh, um, there's uh, uh, there's standard resistors which are close in value to that number of ohms. But if you really want to get something that's really close to that number of ohms, you have to synthesize that number of ohms by combinations of resistors that may be in series or in parallel or whatever else. And so this is a very trivial example. Actually, it's not so algorithmically trivial, um, but it's, it's uh, a very sort of simple example of how one's going from a thing one wants to sort of invent some solution based on what actually exists in the products that are actually sold in actual resistors that you can go buy in a store. OK, next, next question here. Will you expand your apps for iOS and Android, or will you concentrate on one of these? So uh, we're really steaming forward on iOS. Um, iOS has been very successful for us. Um, we have the main Wolfram Alpha app also available on Android. Uh, we've been a little bit disappointed by the fact that as we look at, you know, I, I think I, I put a whole bunch of these, um, oh, that's, that's an iPhone. This is, okay, we can, we can try. I have all these different devices. I have a whole bucket of, of these. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? That's another Android device. That's a, oh, that's a bigger Android device. Um, lots of these things. It's been a little bit disappointing to us that um, as we kind of move Wolfram Alpha, even the, the core Wolfram Alpha app from one device to another, that uh, things don't, don't necessarily uh, work in the best possible way. And some of these devices we can see, you know, if we really built for that device, um, then we could make some really, really good things happen. Um, we haven't yet, I think the ecosystem around uh, Android is not nearly as well developed as it seems to be around iOS. Um, and we've certainly been much more successful in the iOS world than we have yet in the Android world. Um, and we're sort of watching to see what uh, what ecosystems robustly develop around other kinds of platforms. 
Um, it's sort of interesting for me, I, you know, I've been in the computer industry in one way or another for 30 years, and this is sort of a, a moment this year of kind of more platform turbulence than we've seen in perhaps 20 years. I mean, 20 years ago, uh, we were all thinking about, you know, should we port Mathematica to run on this kind of PC-like thing or this kind of workstation or this kind of mini computer or this kind of supercomputer, and gradually all that stuff worked out, and um, pretty soon we were left with basically three platforms there. Um, we're, we're kind of watching the same sorts of things happen, although it's actually, in a sense, more interesting um, in the mobile and other kind of and cloud and so on world. Um, and uh, with Wolf Malfa, you know, our, uh, our strategy is to put our resources into things where we think sort of the best uh, ecosystem exists. And we're certainly, uh, 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 you can expect that the, the sort of the first things are going to happen for us um, on, on iOS. Let's see, this may be the final question. Let's see, what is your vision and goal for Wolfram Alpha? Where do you see its role, say, in, in, in five plus years? Oh, that's a, that's a long question. So uh, sort of the, the original mission is take all this knowledge that exists in the world in all these different specialized areas and get it to the point where all that knowledge, all that sort of expert level knowledge is to the point where Instead of one expecting to have to go ask an expert about the answer to something, one can just go ask Wolfram Alpha and one can get sort of the best research grade answer to any kind of question. Now, uh, th so there's different dimensions to that, to expanding that. So what we've concentrated on right now are some questions that can be stated quite shortly. We're kind of, we're, we're sort of steadily working through this process of, um, uh, of sort of covering all the different domains of knowledge. It's, it's very useful to us that we actually see all these queries coming in because that helps us to prioritize uh, different areas of knowledge and so on. At the beginning, it was really a question of, you know, you just go into the reference library, you look around, you say, you know, which blocks of shelves have we covered now? We're pretty close to having covered all of the standard blocks of shelves in the standard reference library. So now we're kind of exploring uh, more domains of knowledge the rate at which new domains of knowledge come into the world is not actually that fast. Um, it's really, uh, um, and in fact, one thing that's been interesting, we've kind of got this giant to-do list and we were calculating recently at the rate we're going right now, which we hope to be able to ramp up through expanding our organization and so on. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, the current complete to-do list, including all the things of sort of arbitrarily low priority, uh, the rate we're going right now would take about 20 years to complete. Um, we expect that our processes will get a bit more efficient, but I don't think we'll get more than a factor of two in process efficiency. Um, so it's really a question of scaling up what we're doing to be able to cover sort of right down to the tail of all the things that uh, we kind of currently know that we need to do in terms of knowledge domains. I think one of the things that's been interesting is that list, that to-do list, uh, has been sort of getting reprioritized over time, but it hasn't dramatically expanded. We pretty much know what the list is. And that's what, we have to, that's what we have to work on in terms of expanding the knowledge in Wolfram Alpha. As I say, the, the next big thing is being able to not just answer a simply stated question, but to be able to mix a question with uh, not just public data, but also specific data from individual users or within individual organizations. Um, another kind of thing, there'll be a lot of things coming in the near future uh, where we're not just dealing with input that's in the form of uh, here's, a, here's a textual question. For example, images will be one form of input that's coming, will come first to the mobile versions of Wolfram Alpha, um, then uh, uh, to, to other, then to web and, and so on versions, uh, where one's able to uh, upload an image and ask a question about that image, or just upload an image and have Wolfram Alpha tell us things about that image. That's leveraging on this uh, uh, big sort of, uh, I, I think I can say beyond state-of-the-art kind of image processing system that we built in Mathematica over the last several years. Um, so that's another kind of case is, is uh, ingesting other kinds of, uh, 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 of, of data. Um, and I think a big theme will be preemptive delivery of knowledge. So right now, Wolfram Alpha is just, if you go ask it something, it will try and answer you. But the more it knows about you, the more it knows about your environment, your history, and so on, the more it's going to be able to tell you. It's going to be able to annotate your world, uh, telling you knowledge when you need to have it. And I think I see Wolfram Alpha as sort of a, a core component in a lot of what needs to get done there. 
um, both through sort of distribution channels that, uh, that we're building and through distribution channels elsewhere in the world where we are kind of a, a, an underlying technology component um, uh, rather than necessarily providing the complete solution to delivery of things. So, you know, we certainly think about, we have a big list of, uh, you know, queries we hope Wolfram Alpha will be able to do in five years. Um, and there's some, there's some pretty interesting things. I think that uh, sort of what our overall objective is kind of to, uh, it's, it's really all about sort of what technology always does, which is to increase the level of automation of things in the world. And we're trying to really increase the automation of knowledge and expert question answering and so on that can be done. Um, and I think that uh, we're sort of well in the way in that direction. One of the things that I always find interesting, you know, I, a guy who works on big projects um, that last, uh, well, I think I can say decades at least, um, tend to be never-ending projects. And one of the things that I've noticed about big projects and big sort of paradigmatic projects like Wolfram Alpha is that you only really know what's possible after you've sort of lived with the thing for quite a few years. Um, so with Mathematica, for example, it's been 25 years we've been developing Mathematica and it probably took 20 years before we started understanding some of the things that were possible given the symbolic programming, uh, the, 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 the sort of the language platform that exists in Mathematica, what became possible from that. With Wolfram Alpha, I'm actually excited because it seems like perhaps it's because we have a terrific team around Wolfram Alpha, perhaps it's because we've getting lots of great input from, from people in the outside world. I think we're we're, we're faster at understanding the significance of what we've built um, than I've seen in some other big projects. But my expectation is that in five years, sort of about half the stuff that you'll see from Wolfram Alpha in five years is stuff that we can readily imagine today. And half the stuff will be things that we realize three years from now or something. My gosh, that's obvious. That's a really great idea based on the sort of the platform and the, and the, and the paradigm that we've built. But we just had no idea about it right now. Okay, I think um, we should uh, wrap up here. So thanks for, um, thanks for joining us. And uh, I hope, um, uh, thanks for some good questions. I hope uh, people um, are having a, a good time using Wolfram Alpha. We hope to uh, be able to deliver uh, more and more uh, exciting things with Wolfram Alpha in the, in the time to come. So thanks very much.